Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. This is Out of Line After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vasilash, episode 335 for June 17th of 2016. Good, bad, and ugly. New cars and press trips. Watch Out of Line After Hours live at autoline.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Mr. Derry. John, how are you? I'm doing great, actually. That's good, good, good times in the and, industry, I think. Good times in the industry and for the show, because we got to let everybody know we got Scott Burgess with us now. Hi. And uh, Freelancer now. Yeah, it's a Man About Town Publishing uh, is the company that I, time. that I formed. <laughs> we'll write for food. <laughs> Definitely. And we got Chris Pockert with us, too, from CNET. Great to be back. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, great having you guys both here. So we, we should let everybody know we're doing the show in a bit reverse order. In the second half of the show, we've got an interview with uh, Dick Rosen that was pre-recorded. And uh, we'll be getting to that later, and we'll talk a little bit about that now. But wanted to get into it. What's hot? What's going on right now? What have we been doing? And, and, and for those who don't know Dick Rosen, he, he's a former GM designer who designed many famous cars, and I think that uh, you'll be interested in certainly sticking around to hear what he has to say about uh, some of the cars he's worked on. Yeah, great point. So, Chris... Parker, what have you been driving lately? Where'd you just fly in from? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm really tired. Um, I just flew in last night um, from Portugal, uh, and I drove the uh, new Audi A5 and the S5, um, the second-generation versions of those cars, and then the week before, I drove the Macan GTS, so I'm feeling very Germanic lately. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you think of the Audis? Um, the Audi's, are, you know, it's a really nice... Are you car. under embargo on that, or can you talk about it? Well, so I can't talk about driving impressions, but I can talk about the vehicle itself, which, uh, I'll be perfectly honest with you, they did an online reveal, and when I, when I saw the online reveal a couple of weeks ago, I thought, boy, that looks an awful lot like the current car. Um, but in person, it looks very, very different. Um, in the same way that they sharpened up the R8 styling language, they changed a lot of things uh, with the new car. You can see the front end and the back end. Um, you can't see it very well in the photograph that's on the screen right now, but um, there are a lot of really strong character lines, both along the body side and also on the hood, and the front end is lower. Uh, it's an all-new platform, uh, MLB Evo platform. Uh, instead of supercharging, they've gone to turbocharging, so it's a wholly different vehicle. Um, if you've had the chance to drive the new A4, it drives a lot like that car, and that's a great thing in my book. And MLB, that's the, the all-wheel drive platform? It is. This, it, it's all-wheel drive only. You won't be able to get a front-wheel drive version, uh -huh. um, and it's rear-biased all-wheel drive. Uh-huh. Interesting. So... I know you can't give driving impressions. Thumbs up, thumbs down? Two uh, thumbs up? What do you say? Well, I, I, I'll say two things. Um, one, I think it drives great. I think the in-car technology is superior. Um, it, it handles beautifully. The engines are nice and powerful. Um, I prefer the first-gen styling language, which is a little bit more voluptuous, a little more rounded, a little mm -hmm. cleaner. Mm -hmm. This is a little bit fussy to me, but that's you know a matter of interpretation. Some people are really going to like this. We drove through lots of small towns. We drove it on the freeway, and it was breaking necks everywhere. Where'd you drive it? Where'd they have the launch? The launch was in Porto, Portugal, um, and so we got to drive on a lot of really wonderful mountain roads and through little small towns and uh, a little bit on the you know the auto route. Um, so we had a good mix of roads. Hmm. And Gary, you've been driving the uh, new Fiat 124. Yeah, Fiat right? 124 Spider, um, which is based on the Miata, which Scott just bought a Miata. We may get to. Um, so it, it's the it's the Miata platform. Some call it the Fiat because it uh, has has the same DNA. Um, I, I found the styling of the vehicle to be very interesting from the point of view of of much. I mean, almost baroque compared to the mil minimalism of even the the new Miata. Um, and the 124 is more powerful than the new Miata, but it's heavier. So is it a wash? I, I, I actually think there was, there was an opportunity that they, uh, we were in San Diego and, and, uh, they set up a giant autocross route at Qualcomm stadium. And, and so we were able to, to whip the, uh, the, um, uh, Fiat around. They, they had, they'd rented a Miata and we had to drive that on the surface streets to do the back-to-back -back comparison. My, my sense of it is, is that 
the Miata, because it's lighter, is a little more nimble, fun to throw around. Tactile, again. yeah. So, and this is what, a 1.4 turbo in the 124? Yes. And how's it respond? How's it good? You know? Oh, they, they, they did a great job on that. There's, there's virtually no turbo lag at all. And yeah. one of my complaints, one of the very few complaints I've got of the current gen Miata is in the front, pa well, the front passenger seat. <laughs> there is only one passenger seat. Even me, I you know, I'm not a big guy at all, and I didn't think that there was enough leg room. Did they get any more? Because isn't the Fiat a little bit longer? It's it's longer, but the the length is purely fascia. Oh, it's okay. all so, over. So so, the, so, the, so I mean, I checked the dimensions. You know, the the wheelbase for the the two cars are exactly the same. The length is, um, you know, there's there's you know just just about five inches difference. But again, it's just it's just all. Um, Decorative bits, yeah, and, and which is not what you want for handling either, because it's at the extreme ends. It's you know, you you I mean, want all that mass just, centered. I mean, in it's, it's just it's just lightweight plastic. Yeah. I mean, let's face it, it's going to have a Fair it's going to have a big effect. So, on what is it, about hundred pounds difference or something like that? Yeah. Um, so depending on whether you have the manual or the automatic, um, the curb weight for the automatic is ninety five pounds different. To the you know Miata is ninety five pounds lighter, and then in terms of uh, the manual transmission, it's one hundred and four pounds. Difference. That's significant, actually. It, 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 isn't a car, it isn't a car that's that, that's that lightweight to begin with, but I would imagine the average Joe on the street is never going to notice. Well, and the other thing, you know, don't forget that the turbo adds weight. So the mm -hmm. Miata is not turbocharged engine, so mm -hmm. um, there there is some of that. But I but I, I think part of it comes down to that when they developed the the Italian car that they wanted to to add more amenities and make it. Isn't there? It, isn't it quieter? Isn't there a significantly more sound dampening? Yeah, they 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 did a, they did a whole lot of that. It, it it is dead quiet in that car. It's 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 eerie how quiet they made it. And at uh, highway speeds with the the roof up, is it comfortable? Yes, yes. Because that's that's another thing with the Miata. It's not bad, but I wouldn't want to take a long haul trip at highway speeds with the top up. Mm -hmm. in the, in the you know, and the seats are very comfortable. And then then there's an. Um, um, Abarth version of this of this vehicle as well, which uh, um, boosts the um, horsepower by um, four. <laughs> but uh, you know That's, you, that seems nominal. But does does it change the the sound character of the car? Because even like the the five Fiat five hundred Abarth ha sounds like a little motorboat, and it sounds great. Does the the Fiat sound like that? There's there's a discernible difference, but I mean it's it's not it's not a whole lot. But, I, it, I don't... but what I've heard is it's not at all the exhaust note of the the 500 Abarth. Mm. Same engine, but not the same exhaust note. Right, and and um, you know, and you get more torque, so um, that's never a bad thing. It's never yeah. a bad thing. The price point on that though is still pretty high, isn't it? Well, you know, they, they've, they've got a range of prices. You know, it starts under $30,000, and so they're saying, you know, and, 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 you know, they're openly admitting this is basically, you know, the, the second or third car in somebody's garage. This is not necessarily mm -hmm. the first car they're going to buy. It's, 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 you know, an Italian indulgence. And uh, what I thought was sort of interesting was, um, you know, certainly Fiat needs to have more sales in the U.S. market. And so since the Miata launched last year, it wouldn't be really fair to, to look at what Miata sales were for, for 2015. But through May, um, May sales, there were uh, 4,495 4, Miatas sold, you know, which, which is not, not a great much. number. And even the Fiat 500 outsold the Miata. You know, it's, uh, well, that's a more practical car, even though it right. is small, right? And it's much more affordable. Um, more practical? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because it's, it's got back seats. It's got about the same trunk space. Uh, it's a more livable car on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd much rather have the Miata. I own one too, but right. um, it's it, it's it's different. And I think the the problem is they've they've made the new Miata so much like the original, the one that you just bought, um, in terms of the way it feels and all of that. And a lot of us already have Miatas in our driveway. And there's really you know it's a third car. We don't put a ton of miles on it every year. And you wonder, well. Do I really need to get the new one to get basically the same feel um, and, you know, the, the same emotions of driving? Uh, but I've got this car that's only got 50,000 miles in the garage. So it does perfectly fine. I don't need another car payment. And so I wonder if people are just making that decision. Hmm. Yeah, so I, I spent this week driving two Jaguars, the new XE, which is, I know, been out in Europe for, what, over a year now, mm -hmm. and the F-Pace which is Jaguar's first SUV. I call it the SUV that wasn't supposed to be, you know, because Jag's uh, 
JLR's theory was always that Jaguar will do passenger cars and Land Rover will do SUVs. And, you know, so it's a perfect brand combination. And, you know, the vast majority of their dealers are dueled anyway. But then, you know, all of a sudden the market changed and the public is walking away from passenger cars and droves and only buying crossovers and SUVs. I shouldn't say only, but increasingly so. So even Jaguar realized, you know, we got to abandon the strategy that we had. We're just going to be constantly on the sidelines here. And it's a, I wouldn't call it a groundbreaking SUV, even though it's the first one for Jag. It's really good. What's, what's the size? The size is really essentially about the same as the Cadillac XT5 or the uh, the class leader, the Lexus uh, RX. Mm -hmm. It's uh, about the same size and about the same price as those two. And uh, I think it, it'll do well for Jag, you know, because it's a growing segment. It's red hot right now. I think a lot of people who think, God, I love Jaguars, but, you know, I want an SUV. Well, boom, here's the answer to their prayers. It'll, it'll be their number one selling vehicle. Oh, I'm, I'll bet you're right. I'll bet you're right. And very shortly, and, and what I'm predicting, too, is let's call the F-Pace medium. I got to believe there's a small and a large on the way, too. There's a small on the way. We've already seen spy photographs. Okay. So, I mean, and it's it seems pretty fully baked, so I would guess mm. in the next 12 to 24 months, We'll know what it looks like. Yeah. But, um, yeah, they had that, uh, uh, the U.S. media launch in uh, the Colorado Rockies, which was actually a pretty cool place to go driving. I got a speeding ticket, though. I haven't had a speeding ticket in I don't know how long. And I got nailed, but good. <laughs> the hazards of the business. Do you have to pay on the spot? No. He told me, he, he said, uh, oh, man, you're like 30 over here, uh, that requires a court appearance when you leave in the state. I said, first thing tomorrow morning. So he wrote it up for a little bit less. Wow. <laughs> well, that was, that was good of him. Thank you, officer. I, I know. That's right. Uh, thank you, I think. <laughs> 30 over. That's good work you're doing. Oh, yeah. Well, look, it's, it's big country, man. It it's is. It's big country, and they have these ridiculously low speed limits. I mean, ridiculous. Especially near schools. <laughs> no, this is, this is nowhere, there is no school within, you know, we're in the mountains. And I mean, big open valleys mm -hmm. and... Uh, yeah, I mean, so I so what will what will the F Pace do to the sales of the sedans for Jag? Well, you know, the sales of the sedans are nowhere anyway. I don't think they're going to put much of a dent in it. I think this F Pace is going to bring new people into the brand more than existing Jaguar owners saying, "Oh, you know, I, I don't want my you know XJ anymore. I, I want an F Pace." Mm -hmm. I, I bet they got a better shot at getting people in. Who are like, oh crikey, you know, another L, you know, RX Lexus, I, 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 you know, or Audi or BMW or whatever. I want something to totally different. I want it to be in that same size and price and all that, but I want something different. Jaguar's done a very good job of uh, reestablishing that uh, uniqueness to the the brand reputation, mm -hmm. and so you know, it is a great alternative to a Lexus or a BMW or any of those other things. It just has. I, I think a little people all of a sudden think Jaguars are like that again, and that's great for the brand. Um, and I, I agree. I think that it'll, they've already owned a RX, they've already owned a, a five or whatever. So let's move on to the next one and own a F Pace. I, I think the the showroom cannibalization question is not going to be with Jag sedans. I think it's going to be somebody that comes in <coughs> and looks at his uh, Discovery Sport. Yeah. Um, because they're similarly priced, they're about the same size, um, and people may come in and say, yeah, that, I want the off-road thing, but I'm really probably not going to use it that way, and then they're going to find out that you know, the Jag actually drives significantly better on the road than the perfectly fine Discovery Sport, and I think, I think that's where they may run into some problems, um, but they say they're targeting things like the BMW X4 owners and the Macan um, so maybe a little bit more aspirational um, and maybe a little bit more premium than the, the RX and, and all that. So. You know, and that's an interesting point. You know, you mentioned the Porsche Macan, and if you look at how Porsche is doing, at least in this market, is the, the Macan is the number one selling vehicle that they have in, in their showroom now, and uh, number two is the Cayenne. And, I mean, it's almost as though the, the car company that existed so very long of making the legendary cars is now you know, morphing into this company that's making crossover vehicles. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, n nobody wanted that to do that. I mean, Porsche was almost dragged kicking and screaming 
but look, the market's changed. Yeah. You know, if you're just going to build passenger cars here, and 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 what's so amazing to me is this this big move, and it's it's a global move, and it goes from low price to luxury. It's it's across all segments, and it completely caught the industry flat-footed. None of the product planners really got this right. They have onesie twosies here and there. They need a lot more crossovers in their lineups. Every single brand right now, and. That's the other thing that just amazes me is that no one saw this coming. You guys, a Jeep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. But what do you guys think about these trips? Because I got to tell you, you know, uh, we went to Aspen, Colorado. That ain't easy to get to. You know, you, you got to get a connection. Uh, all told, from the time I left the office to the time I got to the hotel, it took eight hours to get there. I mean, you can fly to Europe in eight hours. Well, well, you can, or it can take you almost 24 hours to get back from Portugal, which is what it took me yesterday. That's crazy, Chris. What do you mean, 24 hours? Well, I had a 3.30 a.m. lobby call. This is the glamour of international travel, everyone. Um, and in order to get back, I had to take three flights. Um, so I went... Uh, from from Porto, Portugal, and you know it's about an hour drive to the airport, and then you've got you got to sit get around two hours early. You got to sit around at the airport, and then I took a flight um, to Frankfurt, and then I took a flight from Frankfurt to uh, O'Hare Airport, in Chicago, and you got all those layovers and whatnot, um, and then I had the flight to Detroit, and then I a little bit of a drive to my house. Um, so all in with everything, it was close to 24 hours. Now that's unusual. Normally with Delta service, it, you know it's it's a lot more direct than that, but I had to fly Lufthansa. Um, and it's just one of those wrinkles. I'm not, I'm not complaining. I still had a great time. See, that's, that was my accommodations yeah. on the plane. I'm not complaining. <laughs> um, but it is, it is a significant investment of time um, and, and, you know, effort out, out of the office and all of that. And it is, it's tiring. I had a 4.30 pickup in San Diego last week, so your 3.30 in Europe is not that much. So, Scott, what's, what's the ideal trip here? I mean, because some companies drag them way out and you're there a long time. Others try to do it way too short, in my opinion, at least. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, typically a two-night program where you have uh, you get in, you meet everybody. Um, I would rather have the presentation on the first day uh, to kind of think about it. Then you have a whole day of driving. Uh, I don't so know. You mean, the first day in, get a presentation, then the next day, start the driving. Time. All right, so, so for those who aren't us, who, who don't know what this means, is that basically the way it generally works is that we go someplace and there is a presentation, which is a marketing presentation, an engineering presentation, possibly a design presentation, and given by the people at the company. And in some cases, these are done the morning of the day after you arrive, but in some cases, as you prefer to do it the night before. Yeah, I, I, the only reason why is I, I, I think I have more attention um, then. I, I want to drive well, in. Wait a minute, because you got to explain how these things happen, because usually they have like a cocktail reception where right. all the journalists gather. So this is the first evening. Yeah, and you know, you start giving people some drinks, and then you want to do like a presentation. Well, I would hold off on the drinks until the presentation Absolutely. is completed. Yeah, yeah. and 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 you're, when you say two nights, you're saying basically with domestics, right? You yeah. want you want at least probably three nights if you bother to go overseas. Overseas, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, and one of the things is everybody wants to have something more impressive, um, and there's competition whether it's stated or not between car makers on who has a more glamorous trip. Um, you know. Uh, the travel aside, which sounds much more glamorous than it really is, I mean, it means we get to work in really nice hotel rooms a lot of times. Um, the the things that I want are, uh, I want a 150 miles in the car of me driving. Um, I'm disappointed with trips when I get 50 miles of driving. Mm -hmm. See, I'm a, a bit opposite because like on this trip that I was just on, we drove at least six hours. I didn't get in one of the high-performance versions of the F-Pace. They have a, a 340 and a 380 horsepower version. I never got into 380 horsepower. I'm there bloody six hours driving all different kinds of vehicles, XEs and F-Paces. I want the opportunity to get in every single I, version. And so my preference is I want a central location yes. with loops I can go do, short loops and long loops. Short loops might be 20 minutes. The long loops might be two hours. But I want to be able to come back, jump in something else. I want the manual. I want the automatic. I want the base model. I want the high line. But, but I think the, the, the commonality in here is that you want time in vehicles. 
and you want to, you want time to drive and to you know to nitpick and all those little things. And sometimes, you know, you'll fly all the way you know halfway around the world and get no time in the car. I've I've literally gone to South Africa, and I've had a half an hour stuck in bumper to bumper traffic, and two or three laps on a racetrack, and that's it. Yeah, that's. Um, nice. And I, it's hard for me to turn around a you know a review in in those sort of circumstances. So my thing is, you're talking about. Automakers wanting to outdo each other with luxury. Look, we all appreciate having a good night's sleep. Um, I want time in the car because increasingly we're all asked to do different things. It's not like it used to be. Not everybody uses stock photographs. Some of us have to take our own photographs or do video stand-ups or do social media and all that. That's a lot to do. So more time with the vehicle. I, you know, put me up in a Motel 6. I, I don't. I'll, I'll still be there. I don't care. I, I'll still I, I be there. I, it's it's not about the glamour and all that. Like just, I want concentrated time with the vehicle. Well, but but another thing you guys got to take into account, though. It it seems to me now. I I don't know this to be a fact, but it seems to me that on these trips that in some regards they are, and this is dubious for them, but a reward for the people who worked on the program. Mm -hmm, okay, mm -hmm. they worked on the program, so they get to go to a nice hotel, You're right? Saying, like the chief engineer, the chief, the chief engineer, designer. whatever, right? So, so these poor bastards are are in places that the Motel Six, you know, the, the, makes the, 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 these hotels that were motels they stay in. The Motel Six is a Ritz Carlton. Mm -hmm. To what they did when they were developing these in things. Death Valley or whatever. So, yeah, so I mean, it's it's part of that is is the reason why I think they're there, and the other part is is that oftentimes these places are um, accessible to good driving routes. I, that's true, um, and well, I mean, the joke is if you're going to Miami, you know, the car has no dynamic <laughs> capabilities, <laughs> right? That, because that's exactly right. The roads are straight, right. and flat. There's not going to be a turn and anywhere. Clogged yeah, with right. traffic. Yeah, you can tell a lot about. The, the automaker's confidence in the vehicle by the location of the, the event. Mm -hmm. You know, other thing I like is not only to be able to get in every single one of the vehicles, I love to be able to grab one of the marketing people or one of the engineers or something. Come on with me because I got a zillion questions as I'm driving and it's like, oh yeah, what's this, what's this? And if you can ask them while it's fresh in your mind, while you're going through it right there and get the answer, man, that helps so much. Although I, fi I find that when I have the engineer sitting next to me and I'm driving, that I just really want to engage more in the conversation with this person, and so it, it takes my attention away from, away from what I'm supposed to be doing, which yeah. is driving. But, but to your point, and I, I, I like the loop setups. I've done a bunch of programs where they've did, done loops, and you're, I, I like that a lot, um, because you can decide if you want to have, you could take a person for a 20 minute ride, and then he can ride in with, talk to a lot of people. Um, if you want one of some of the longer rides, that works well too. That, and to Chris's point, when you have to shoot photos, when you have to do video, when you have to do all of that other stuff. When you got a file. <laughs> yeah, you can determine when you stop, when you begin. Um, if you wanna get 200 miles driving that day, it's not that hard to do. Do a couple of longer loops, uh, and, and you can get a chance to look around and stuff. Uh, I mean, as much travel as I've done in the past, you know, I have a giant wall, uh, or giant map on my wall at home, and I put pins in places I go to. I don't include any automotive trips and the reason why is i really didn't go there i didn't really see anything no that's true and that's a great point everybody thinks oh you went to germany oh you went to you know wherever in the world oh you stayed at this grand hotel it's like i didn't see any of that stuff no you see the life through the the side window and you know all the places that you want to come back to to go back and explore but you don't really if, if you're lucky usually you have you might have like 45 minutes to walk around in you know a morning and it's always cool and you know i mean right. i'm not trying to take it away from it i also like regional programs when they're here in detroit and i can go for the day and um actually drive the car around we'll go usually somewhere out towards hell because those are better roads and you can meet the executives you can talk to them they're Everything so, is accessible. It's a great way to really familiarize with a new vehicle. Yeah. My least favorite are these overnight trips, like out to the coast. I hate those. I really don't want to go on them. So fly out there, get in a car, drive. Those, those go to the hotel, get up the next morning and fly home. And fly home. It's like drive to the airport and fly out. I, yeah. I waste so much time traveling, mm -hmm. you know, for for so, so anyway. Yeah, I, I I hate those overnighters. But fortunately, I think those are happening less than they used to. Like when things True. got into crisis, everybody started to try and well, that save I some money. I and, understand and, when right. everyone's got to cut costs. Yeah. But but to what we were talking before, if you want to do it at the proving ground and we got to stay at the Motel Six, I'm still going to be there. Yeah. 
And I, I think, you know, we should all say, like, you know, we're suggesting little things or grousing here and there. We all recognize that we are tremendously privileged to do what we do. Oh, yep. And it is an amazing opportunity to get to drive cars that we would otherwise maybe never have the opportunity to drive, let alone afford, um, or to travel and see little bits and pieces of the world that, that we couldn't otherwise. Uh, or have access to many of the people that they bring on these programs. Yeah. That, I mean, if you try to get on their, their calendars otherwise, good luck. I mean, uh, one thing that I've liked is that they've stopped bringing uh, all of the top executives to the programs. So you mean CEO level? CEO, you know, the Mary Bears or Mark Royces. Um, I wouldn't mind Mark Royce. I, I, I enjoyed getting the chance to talk to him, but I also think that it deflects away from... Uh, from what you're there to do. And so I I actually like that you don't see that as often anymore. And that seems to be a recent change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, enough of that topic, because we, we got a couple of other things that we've got to get here. This weekend, 24 hours of Le Mans, you know, and uh, this is going to be a battle royale. You know, we've had several of the people who are going to be racing there on this very show. Uh, the people who worked on uh, the Ford GT, about a month ago, we had Doug Fian, who runs Corvette Racing, on here. But even more importantly, this is a setup because Dr. Data has a number that relates to the 24 hours. All right, so, so, so Carmen, bring the first slide up, please. So what do we think we're looking at there? Oh, my God. 98 horsepower, 93 MPH, miles an hour. I got to believe that is the horsepower of the winning car of the first ever 24 hours, and that the speed was probably what they hit on the Mulsanne straight. Boy, you, you'd win like a prize. Is that right? We had is one, that, yes. So, so bring up the second one. So, so here we go. This was the, the race. It was driven by Andre Lagache and Rene Lenard. In, in 1923, that was the first Le Mans. Look at that car. And, and I bet 93 miles an hour with those tires was, was scarier than Oh, my God. No <laughs> three, kidding. Three liter engine. Big stones. I-4. Yeah. Look, uh, 93 miles an hour in 1923. That's Holland. That's Holland. And what's the name of that car? The Chenard Walker? Mm hmm. I've never thought, even heard of that. French vehicle. Yeah, it sounds like a you know home built special or something. But mm -hmm. everything, I mean, the road surface not the same. The brakes certainly weren't the same as what they right. are now. That's that's yeah, real well, what speed. Yeah, was the original Mulsanne straight? Wasn't that like four miles long? That, it was definitely longer. Yeah. And yeah, today they've put in all these chicanes yeah. because they'd probably be hitting four hundred miles <laughs> an hour, <laughs> or something to those uh, degrees. But so how's, how's Ford, Ford going to do? You know, I, I, if I were betting my money... <laughs> we, can, we, we can see Chris's face on this. Gor well, gorgeous car, but, uh, I mean, it's really early, and it takes a lot of time to develop cars that can hold up over endur endurance race durations. And But they do have a win. They won at um, Laguna Seca. And didn't they take a second place at Spa, too, I think, already? They, they crashed sure one of their cars yeah. heavily there. But I, I, I think they got a second place as well. The interesting thing about the Ford GT program is the drivetrain, the engine, certainly, is is a well-proven race engine. You know, they've been racing that in prototypes and the like. Um, but, man, Corvette has got the record. You know, they've won 50% of the races that they've entered mm. since it was officially Corvette Racing doing, you know, the official team, which is an extraordinary record. And then you got Porsche, you got Ferrari, you got Aston Martin, you got BMW. I mean, it, Audi. Audi. It's a terrific category. So, what do you think, Scott? I don't know. It, it, it's a. It's not a big deal if the GT doesn't do much. So it's a great position to be in. So, if it could place or be in the top five, I mean, that's huge. I don't. I don't know if it will. I think that to Chris's point that. The endurance part is one of the things that you have to really look at. But, I mean, it's great that they're back in. Um, it's wonderful that they're back in. Uh, the car looks great. Okay, so, so if they don't do well, do you think they'll go back next year? I think they will. Um, but over the long haul, that's the question. You know, people can come in for a few years and, you know, put together an effort and you know, have a budget earmarked. But... After three or four years, I think that's when a lot of people sort of peter out. It ain't cheap. No, it, you know, it, and it's really expensive. And I think if you look at it as purely a PR expense, that's a problem. You know what I mean? I think that those budgets come and go. But if you look at it as an engineering budget, like the way, you know, Audi, their motorsports effort, that comes out of their engineering budget, right? right? Not out of marketing. That's and correct. it's way different. It's just a different right. mindset. 
What I'm hoping, is, I, I believe Ford will be back for at least the next three years after this. I, I believe it's a four-year program. I don't know that for a fact. But uh, what I'm hoping is at the end of whatever year effort this is, that they come out with an all-new car and go for the overall win, not just the GTE Pro. That's what I'm hoping for. I, I think they, they sort of woke up three years ago that, oh, my God, the 50th anniversary is coming up of when we won the race overall, and they won it for four years in a row, remember. So I'm hoping that they said that, you know, they came to their senses and said, oh, man, if we go for the overall win, it's going to cost so much more money. It's going to be so much more of an effort. Why don't, we, why don't we go after something where we think we've at least got a chance? And they've got a chance. They could win it. I don't think they will. My money's on Corvette just because of their past record. But I'm hoping that this is just a prelude to going after the overall win. What do you think the odds are of that? I, I, I agree with John. I think it's going to be a long shot for them to win. Um, I would love to see it. It'd be a wonderful story. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful vehicle. Uh, it's a great, you know, thing that they're back in racing in this way. Um, but I wouldn't put money on it. How about you? It'll win. <laughs> <laughs> and Gary, you put all of us on the spot. What do you think? I don't think it'll win. Sorry, Scott. I, I'm, I'm a little dubious about what their commitment will be. And, you know, as you said, in order to get the overall win, that's, that's a boatload full of money that they're going to have to put into that vehicle. And I think that with all of the changes that are going on in terms of their production vehicle programs, in terms of all the money that they're spending on software companies, all the money they're spending on developing autonomous vehicles, that, you know what, when they look at that budget for Le Mans and say, hmm, what does this get us, versus, hmm, look at these other guys are doing, maybe we ought to take some of that money and stick it into a self-driving fusion. I think that's where they're, oh, they're going to go. Yeah, no, that's good It's the perfect ending to a great story yeah. that, that they win. So I'm going to go with the win. Okay. <laughs> hey, we've got some questions here, too, that we got to get to before we wrap up the segment. Um, as you guys know, Ed Niedermeyer, uh, another journalist. Uh, who's broke, been on the show. Who's been on the show here, too. Broke the story that uh, Tesla's got all these problems with its suspension. And they forced owners to sign this non-disclosure agreement and if they did that, then the company would fix everything. I've never heard of any such thing being done for a repair or a warranty item. And then the whole thing blew up, thanks to Niedermeyer, that, hey, this sounds like you're not able to report this to NHTSA, that there's a potential defect in the vehicle. And just curious, what do you guys think about all this? Um, I interviewed Ed earlier today um, about this story. And the non-disclosure non agreement is actually the big deal. The ball joint... It could be just one that was bad. It happens. Um, but uh, the reason I interviewed him was to talk about the reaction uh, from... And, and bring the audience up to speed in case they haven't. Well, uh, Musk came out with a blog uh, through the Tesla team that basically accused uh, Niedermeyer of fabricating stuff for the story as well as... Um, standing to gain financially. Standing to gain financially. It was the most ridiculous accusation I've ever seen. Well... Musk knows that when he puts that stuff out there, that he has this mob, this virtual mob that will do anything for him. And they just launched into relentless attacks on Niedermeyer um, through comment sections, through tweets, through um, every means possible that they just attacked him. You know, how are you? Why? I hope you lose money on your stock that you invested. Um, uh, when I talked with Ed, we joked about the fact that, you know, auto journalists really don't have that much money tied up in the stock market um, due to <laughs> what we're paid. Um, and uh, and he even came out with a statement saying that I have never owned Tesla stock. I've never done this. Um, and uh, it was it was just amazing what happened. But, you know, the, the column that I'm writing for Motor One is that they use all these half truths, which are really half lies. Um, to drum up all of this stuff. And no, the, the NDA did not include the word NHTSA in it anywhere. It just said that you were not allowed to tell anyone or you could face financial ruin, basically. Fines of one guy, I think, was said he could be fined up to $150,000 from Tesla. Um, whether or not that was intentional, or it, it, it's hard to say. You can't say that they were doing it to avoid safety recalls. 
But at the same time, that's what it said. The wording was conveniently and purposefully vague, I think. Yes. Um, and it's also in the manner in which things are presented to the person. So you've got somebody who has a, you know, a suspension problem or, or any other problem with their Tesla, and, and the deal is they go to the dealer and it's out of warranty, and, and Tesla says, hey, you know, we'll cover the, either the entire cost or maybe half the cost to prorate it for you if you sign this piece of paper that says, you know, you, we just need to be protected. Um, so if you sign here, we're going to give you thousands of dollars worth of work. Um, and it's not something that really seems to have a lot of precedent in this business. I've never heard of this. Never heard of it. But, uh, but, but the whole notion of Tesla is unprecedented in this business. So, I mean, I think we have to take that into account. Right. And, and, and this thing is, is that nobody is being forced to sign these things. Okay, this guy we had the problem, 70,000 miles, which, you know, most warranties are less than 70,000 miles, right? right. And, and so he has this problem, and he goes into his local dealer, and he says, okay, we'll, we'll take care of this, but, you know, here's the deal. you got to sign this. But who knows? Actually, he didn't go to a local dealer. He went to a service center. Well, um, right. There are okay. no local dealers Good. Um, to actually address those issues. Point taken. And, and who knows what was said in that conversation, because it's not on, you know, it's not written. Um, I, I think it's, 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 at the very least, it's suspect. Um, and NHTSA basically came out and said, you know, we find this agreement troublesome. So Tesla has had to revisit the language and make it a little bit more explicitly clear like that, yes, if you have a, a defect, you can still report this to the government. Um, but I, I think it's, it's, it's a little, little convenient and a little uncomfortable. And, and yes, Tesla does not operate in the manner in which a normal automaker historically is operating. No, Tesla bullies anyone that criticizes them. They have a, he has a lot, there's a long record of that. Um, and that's what they do. And the problem that Tesla is really going to run into and where this is going to hurt them is right now they're a niche car producer that makes just a, a what, 10 or 12,000, 20,000 in the, over the course of a year. Um, there may be 100,000 Model S's on the road. They're now saying that they want to make half a million cars a year. There's going to be a much different world when um, people are buying $40,000 uh, Model 3s than the $120,000 Model S. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think, I think that this is going to, it's, it's a lack of maturity um, on Tesla's part. And I don't think that it's going to hold up very long when you have, you can't attack your customers every time something goes wrong with your car. Well, and, and the funny thing is, I think people have this impression that when it's a very expensive car, you have much higher expectations about quality and reliability. And I don't think that could be further from the truth. It's interiors made with from the Mercedes spare parts bin. You know, I mean, it's, let's face facts, Consumer Reports took it off its recommended list because pieces are just falling off of the car. <laughs> and one of the things that we're seeing now is the the, the long-term reliability of Model S's is, is not very good. We're just now seeing cars with 60, 70,000 miles on it. They had the whole problem with their electric motors. They're um, replacing the bushings in that at 60,000 miles. Um, there, there are definitely issues. I think the, the Model S, I will still say, is a wonderful vehicle. I, I like the Model S. It, I, I just want it brand new. I never want one that's used. It, it's fantastic to drive. I think Tesla should be commended for pushing the industry forward um, in, into electric vehicles. I think they're... They're really incredibly innovative companies. Now, are you saying this but out of fear that Musk might send not, his people not, not in the on lead. you, or is it? Um, I saw them outside the studio. <laughs> they were they were lurking in the bushes. <laughs> it's going to land one of his rockets on your head. That's right. See, but, but it doesn't matter. We all live in a hologram anyway, according yeah. to Elon. <laughs> so you know, not, this is all. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a lot of wonderful things about both their products and the company. But I think you're exactly right. There's a ton of growing up to do. Um, and going to the mass market, I think, is going to be incredibly difficult for them. I think you know, the expectation that the Model 3 will be available in the volumes that they're saying it's going to be available. Or at the price. At the, well, I think they'll get to the price, but I, I don't think they're going to get their volume targets, and I certainly don't think they're going to get their timeline targets. So if you're number 100,000 in line you know, with your, your $1,000 deposit, I don't think you're going to get your car until 2020-ish. And, and you're not going to get your federal rebate at that point. You won't either. get your federal rebate. And, um, you know, who knows what the health of the company is going to be at that point because they're burning through money like crazy. Well, if you lose money on every car you sell, you can't make it up in volume. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, that's one of the problems that they face is the, the places where they've made money are Zev credits um, and some of these other uh, supported ideas. So, you know, I, I, I agree. I like the Model S. I think that the interior has always been crappy. Um, 
we get fooled when they put an iPad in the middle. Anytime you do that, we auto journalists really, really like that. Um, <laughs> no, we liked it when they did it. Now everybody else is doing it. We don't like it. Yeah, so it's much. Not, as, not as impressive. And they have disrupted the industry in, in lots of good ways. Um, I just find that this instance is just a, is one on a long list of times that. Absolutely. That, uh, Absolutely. And, and, and the way that, went, that, that Musk went after Niedermeyer. Yeah. Um, and, and frankly, I think misaligned the story with the, the owner. You know, he lived at the end of a dirt road and we needed two tow trucks to get it. Uh, the guy has come out and said, I don't live on a dirt road. I almost never drive on dirt roads. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's almost political the way he's playing it. So, it sounds like something more out of, a, you know, the current election campaign uh, than, than it is automotive. And it's, it's just, it's crazy. It really, really is. Yeah, well, kudos to Ed Niedermeyer for digging this all up. Yep, absolutely. It was good, good journalism. Okay, two, two other quick ones. Uh, Phoenix 286 wrote in to say, why doesn't FCA just drop Dodge and make Fiat the entry point? I think it's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> are you afraid Sergio's minions are um, outside? <laughs> <reading you up? laughs> no, um, I... Dodge is a brand that, you know, I think has lost its luster. It's American muscle. Come on. I think that that's about the only saving grace on it. I've, I've always liked the. I think that if you want to bolster Chrysler, where there's, there is potential to uh, create more of a luxury brand, which would get you more money, um, that, that I would work on that. Um, but look, and is Dodge, that is only, uh, Dodge has only lost its luster. It's got nothing new. You know, where, where's the Durango replacement? Where's the Journey replacement? Where's a, finally a dart that's halfway good? You know, all they've got is the Charger and the Challenger, essentially. That's the only thing they've put any money into. And here they've taken the brand that used to do like 600,000 plus units a year. And I don't know what it's down to right now, but they're deliberately killing it. Yeah, I mean, that's the way it looks. And, and, uh, and maybe it is, maybe it will. I don't, I don't see Dodge customers going, oh, well, I'll get a Fiat instead. No. no, and and Fiat hasn't been doing any great shakes in this business oh, anyway. Yeah, it, I, don't let, I don't want to let numbers get in the way of uh, the story <laughs> here, but uh, so so um, for May 16, there are 43,000 Dodges sold and 3,100 Fiats. Yeah. So what about I'll, Chrysler's? Um, uh, Chrysler. Total Chrysler twenty four hundred. So See, that, there's room to 24, grow there. Twenty four thousand. Twenty four thousand. Yeah. Too, too many. 20, so, too so, many so basically, people. we've got okay, but okay, forty three for Dodge, twenty four for Chrysler, and three for Fiat. But uh, so that's spread over how many models? Dodge. <laughs> <laughs> and why would you think Fiat would work in a volume setting? In the well, US? you know, look, the market switched. The markets walked away from small entry level cars. You know, and even though Fiat's got pseudo crossovers, they're not selling. Well, the, it's the five hundred X. Yeah, but it's not selling. It might be their best seller, but mm. the sales of numbers are like no, oh, it, um. it's yeah. okay. One last one then. Uh, Mike wrote into. I, you know, I, I love the, the Honda Ridgeline. I've written about it. We've reported about it. He says, but aren't you unhappy there is limited control of transmission shifting, low gearing, and no descent control? So none of that bothers me. You know, this is a pickup. Uh, hill descent control, that's great for off-roading. Yes, this has capabilities, pretty good capabilities for going off-road. Uh, People who are serious off-roaders are not going to buy a Ridgeline. They're going to go out and get a Tacoma I've, TRD. I've, I've, I've got the Tacoma TRD right now. Yeah. And, uh, and it's an awesome off-road vehicle. Mm -hmm. And uh, my left calf is really hurting me because of that clutch. But <laughs> And, you know, so limited control of the trend. Look, I'm one of those people. I'm not into paddle shifting. You know, if I get an automatic transmission... I put it in drive, and that's why you get an automatic. So you don't have to do anything. That's why else. they invented them. And listen, I'm a guy who loves heel and toe, manual transmission cars. I'm, you know, it's not like you know, I'm opposed to shifting, but if you got an automatic, you bought an automatic so you don't have to do all that. So, no, I, I still love the Ridgeline. I think this thing's going to be a home run for Honda, but I will say not in year one, not in year two. I think it's going to take three years for word of mouth to get out. I think year three is going to be the sweet spot for the mm. Ridgeline. And, and what is a home run in terms of volume? Oh, that's a good question, real good question. I, I would say they'd probably be happy with 40,000 first year or so, first 
12 to 16 months, I think they got a chance at pushing up to 80,000 in that's, year three. That's pretty bold, and that's still behind the Tacoma, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, that'd still be behind it, right? Yeah. But for Honda, that would be a major home run. That would be a huge home run, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't be surprised to see 80. I wouldn't say 80 at the end of the second year. Um, I think it's the a complete package. One, there's tons of Ridgeline owners that have been waiting for a Ridgeline that would never have bought a a Toyota or a Chevy. Um, and two, I think that this truck um, just has more of a truck look and can lure in other buyers, whereas the other Ridgeline didn't. The other Ridgeline was like a fake truck. <laughs> and this one looks looks and feels so more like a real truck. It looks like a truck, drives like a car. I don't always think that that's a good thing for a truck. I it, want my truck to ride like a truck. It's a very, very rational approach to what is often an irrational segment, uh, you know, of, of purchasers. They, you know, they typically are driven around with empty beds or, or very little in it. Um, and they don't get taken off-road, but they get, have off-road suspension. So this, this Honda is a much more sensible product. It's, you know, rides better, probably a little bit better fuel economy and those sorts of things. But I, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not as bullish on the the sales, even though I I you know think that it's a very smart product. I can't say that I've driven it yet, um, but you know based on the approach and what I've read about it already, it, it seems like it's a well designed, um, you know, decently styled product. But I don't know that it's going to be something that that shake up shakes up the market. Well, look. We got to wrap up this segment of the show, and we got another segment to go to. But Gary, why, why don't you explain to the audience? What, what the, we've got coming up here. All right, so um, as, as we indicated at the top of the show, there's a guy, Dick Rusin, who had been a longtime General Motors um, designer and worked all around the world for General Motors. And uh, um, there's a car show that will be coming up here shortly. The Eyes on Design is Show. It next, this, is it this weekend? This yeah, weekend. it's this weekend. It's this weekend. And, and so, so Dick was actually, uh, he helped orchestrate this Eyes on Design, and he'd gotten a hold of Jack Telnack and Chuck Jordan. Former and, head and of Tom, design at and, Ford. And, and Tom yeah. Gale, and got these guys together and said, hey, let's put on really a show that's, that's dedicated to design. And so one of the vehicles that will be at that show is the Bitter CD, which um, Dick was instrumental in designing over in Germany. And this vehicle, interestingly enough, and as you'll learn, was basically um, predicated on a design that Dick had done for a Vega-based Oldsmobile Coupe. Is that right? Is That's that right. Using... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, 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 he, he's, a it's very, a he's, he's a very interesting guy, and he talks about his Mangusta that he'd owned that used to be owned by Chuck Jordan. Um, there, there's a lot of interesting stuff in, in what he has to say. So I, I strongly urge you guys to all stay online. I can't wait to meet him. <laughs> <laughs> he'll, he'll be in Chris's chair. Okay, and with that, I'll be in your chair. We got a wait. Chip t is telling us something here. What? Please apologize to Jonathan Brown. He called in. The computer aid is called. Oh, Jonathan, I don't know if you heard that. We apologize. I know that you had uh, called in with a phone call, but the computer donate the call. So uh, sorry about that. Uh, save the question for next week. We'll get to it then. Right now, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and we'll come back with that segment with Dick Rosen. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts, all delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. Okay, we're back. We've got Dick Rosen in the studio with us right now. And Dick, great to have you here on AutoLine After Hours. Thank you. So just so uh, the audience tuning in, I know we, we talked a little bit about it, but just give us a quick thumbnail of what you've done in your career here. Well, I, I, I graduated from Michigan State in 1959, went to work for Fisher Body. That's, I couldn't get into design. And then uh, two and a half years later, I managed to get in there. I worked in Oldsmobile studio on the first Tornado and uh, a number of other cars. And then I went off uh, to a great place called Preliminary Design where uh, it was kind of like a think tank and they did a lot of scale models. So I had an opportunity to do a lot of cars in there completely myself um, in scale form. 
And then I worked around the building in different studios and um, in 1971 was sent to Germany to work at Opal Design for six months. Uh, then after that, um, became uh, chief designer and uh, ran my own studios and I was the studio that created the X cars. Uh, we had a big big room and we, we did a lot of cars. We had to sell the concept to the corporation. Um, from there, I went to Chevy 2, which there were three Chevrolet studios, and Chevy 2 was the one that did the small cars and all the high-volume sedans. So we did those cars. I was there for about eight years and then uh, was moved to Cadillac Studio and the 92 Seville, the Eldorado, later DeVille, and the Fleetwood, all the four and a half years of uh, those cars. And then they sent me to Germany again, um, to, and I was there for almost five years as director of design GM Europe. Then I came back to the States for three years as director of design for Chevrolet. And then I had a chance to retire early, and I did. And you also got this car show going that's coming up uh, this weekend, what they call right. Eyes on Design. Right. And uh, you're the guy who started this. So give us a little bit of the thinking because... I, it's different from other classic car shows. In fact, it's really not a classic car show in a sense, is it? No, in fact, they've wandered a little bit from the roots. Um, the, the, my wife was a reader. There's a, a charity that lives near us, that has their offices near us, uh, um, and uh, they do different things for the blind. Detroit Institute of Ophthalmology, and my wife was a reader. She would read the local paper. Blind people can get news, national news, you know, local, big local news, but they can't get any news from their community, but it's in the newspaper. So what they would do then is they would have somebody read. They had a whole team of people reading different parts of the paper, tape it, take it back. This is overnight. Somebody would convert it all to a tape and then bring it out to people who were blind who couldn't. And that was, that's how they got their local news. Mm -hmm. So my wife was a reader, and she had a newsletter, and it said they, were gonna, they wanted to do a car show. So I said, well, I can put my Mongoosta in the show. So I called up, and uh, they were in very early stages. They had an idea that they wanted to do a show. They were going to do it behind their building. They had room for about 20 cars. And I said, well, you know, there's another show on the other side of town called Meadowbrook that they have 200 cars, in the, and they're a national force. Uh, they didn't know about it. So anyway, I put together a concept for them, and in th uh, we had six weeks. And the ladies that ran that, they were very good at doing uh, uh, cake sales, parties, all that kind of stuff. They were really good at it. And so I was the only one. So I, I, I gave them really good direction, and um, I went out and put... Uh, I had one of the designers had a beautiful sketch of a uh, contemporary car with an old Rolls Royce in the background. And I got that as a poster, and we w I went out and put flyers in as many cars as I could, and we got 100 cars. We had it at the, the uh, Gross Point Academy, the first one. We had it there for two years. And that was the beginning. And the first year they made money like they never thought they would. Uh, and... Uh, so they decided to adopt it and really go for it. And but explain so the concept. Yeah, sorry, Gary. I was going to say, so this, this is to go for the Detroit Institute of Ophthalmology to help people like your wife doing the reading and so on. Yeah. So, so that was, uh, that's, how I, that's how I got to them was through right. her. Uh, my idea was not to do a classic car show as Meadowbrook was, but to do a design show. Nobody was doing a design show. And Explain we, what you mean by that, a design yeah, show. Yeah, here we were in Detroit, and uh, we had the three major car design studios in Detroit. We had the huge design profession, and the idea was to get them together, so I called up, uh, I talked to Chuck Jordan. I was in Cadillac Studio at the time. I talked to Chuck Jordan about what I wanted to do, and he said, great, I'll, we'll, we'll give you four cars. And he was running GM design yeah. at the time. Uh, no, he was, uh, he, Irv, uh, yes, he was. He was chief, to, he was the vice VP of design. And so, um, so he said, I'll, 
the idea was to take the concept cars that you see in the, at the Detroit show and have them outside on the grass for people to see, like real cars. And, uh, and then have classes, uh, you know, traditional concours classes, and, but everything focused on design, everything. The, the program, uh, the artwork, the poster, everything is design-oriented. In other words, you weren't not necessarily looking for concours quality cars that have been immaculately no, no. restored. I wrote, you were basing it, you wanted a car in the show based on just yeah. the design of the car. I wrote all the rules, I wrote all the judging rules. Uh, we got a great guy uh, from Chrysler, Jeff Godshall who stayed and did it for like 25 years. But I, I wrote all that stuff. I did the whole concept. Uh, and um, the idea was it was a design so show. Everything was focused on design. And we had a Jeep in the first show. And everybody said, why would you have a Jeep in a car show? It makes no sense at all. So the, you're, you're talking about the original the, 1943, whatever, yeah, Willys, it was, it was, right? Yeah, it, was, it wasn't... Uh, yeah, it was. You're not a, talking Grand Cherokee. No, it was the original <laughs> Jeep concept. Those vehicles. Um, so, you know, once once we the focus was on design, so everything had to pass through a design filter. High quality, uh, you know, uh, the logos, the artwork, the tickets, everything. Uh, designers were involved in all the different activities, like the brunch. There was a, uh, a brunch, uh, which exists today still. Uh, there was a designer in charge of that. And uh, the idea was, is to, uh, and what I did was I put together a little uh, concept of it and sent it around to Ford Chrysler and GM. The idea was to have the design management choose um, young people, designer or assistant chief designer, and get this added experience of running this unusual kind of thing all on his own or her own. And so that went along great for a number of years uh, and was very successful. Mm. Did, you, did you put your Mangusta in the first show? Yeah, the Mangusta was in the first show, and Larry Erickson uh, had one of the classes. He was working for me in Cadillac Studio mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, yeah, I had the Mangusta in the show. See, and his, his Mangusta had been Bill Mitchell's Mangusta. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, yeah. Ended, he ended up uh, buying it in a blind auction, in effect. Yeah, they had a, to to sell cars at that time that they had purchased for evaluation. Explain that a little bit, because I think a lot of people don't realize that car companies buy a lot of competitor cars. Yeah, and, and through the years, they, they evolve how they handle them, how they test them, how they get rid of them, Okay. But at that, well, some are torn down to pieces, yeah, right? And some you, are crushed to gain the knowledge, uh, the structural knowledge. Mm -hmm. So they have program for that. But now. some beautiful cars happen to make it through the whole process yeah. intact. At that time, they would they were they'd sell them, and uh, the way they sold them is they brought uh, three dealers in, give us a price, and then they took the highest price and offered it to interested employees. There were three of us uh, that put our name in to buy it, and I couldn't go. We were having uh, we were doing a show for Ed Cole, and I couldn't go, and I got a phone call, and a young woman in purchasing said, we're going to uh, have a drawing. There are three of you. She said, we're going to have a drawing to see who gets the car. I said, what car? I, uh, my mind was somewhere else. She said, the Mangusta. I said, oh, yeah, I forgot. I put my name in. Okay, so I said, that's... She said, can you come at 2 o'clock? I said, I can't come at 2 o'clock. Can, can, I, can I be the one that's left in the hat? And um, she said, Sure. And uh, she said, the, the one that's left in the hat's going to get the car. I said, whatever. So I hung up. And I was really more of a mind to want to, part to have a chance to get it, not necessarily thinking I could really get it or I would want to really get it because I didn't have the money. But I heard that you could get these cars at killer prices. It was, but it's still it's still more money expensive. than you had. Yeah. He had to go home and tell his <laughs> wife that he was he was buying this car, and yeah. she was not on. But but I thought it was interesting, you know, as you said that they bought cars, and so what I, what I thought was interesting the story that you had told um, when you were writing about your your vehicle that um, Bill Mitchell had gone to Italy to the Turin show, and right. much to the chagrin of the in-house accountants at design staff, yeah. he came back with with three cars, the Mangusta, a Maserati Ghibli, and a Lamborghini Espada. Wow. But all three. And he promised those Italian engineers that had quit Ferrari, I think they were engine engineers, and were building their own car, ATS, he promised he would buy one from them. 
So he comes back in, uh, in the show was in October. So he comes back, and then around January, a Maserati appears, yellow, Ghibli, beautiful car. <laughs> and then uh, right after that, a silver Espada. I had a chance to ride in it once, just gorgeous. Silver exterior, silver interior, beautiful car, 12-cylinder engine, huge engine and transmission, you know, as big as that car is, it, the engine transmission was huge. Uh, and then in May, the Mangusta came. Well, the Mangusta came very late because I figured out after they made the custom air cleaner, which had to be reversed compared to the Ford air cleaner. Because they had a Chevy engine on it. Yeah. After they made the air cleaner, somebody stole the carburetor. Big, a big uh, Rochester four barrel, right? Quadrajet. So this was stolen out of like the design studio? No, garage? Di Tommaso. Oh, Di Tommaso. Oh. It's stolen in Italy. Oh. So they never could drive it. So they sent it over and it came by plane. And uh, apparently, we figured this out. What they did, since it was coming, they didn't want it to jounce. So they tightened all the suspension, but they didn't tell anybody. So the car gets here at the tech center. And uh, they got another carburetor from Chevrolet. And a good friend of mine was in charge of those cars. His name was Doug Patterson. He was from Chrysler. He had run the Chrysler uh, racing program. And when that's, all that stopped, design hired him because he was really an aerodynamicist. And we were starting big aero programs. And, and I was, our studio was the one that started. And we went to Pasadena a lot. And, and Doug, you know, we, Doug ran that. So I knew him very well. And he was in charge of Mitchell's special cars. So they got another uh, carburetor and they got it running. And, um, and then uh, people drove it. Finally, Bill Mitchell drove it. And this concept, show cars of those days, if you look at the old pictures, the seat backs are vertical. So this car had vertical seat backs and uh, the suspension was all tied down. They had ripped a tire, taking it into a studio on one of the platforms, so they put glass belt tires on it, which had straight vertical sidewalls. So it rode like a stone. And um, he drove it once around the lake. He was so upset uh, the way it rode, the way, it, the way he sat in it, the fact that his head was right up against the windshield and the rearview mirror was back here. Uh, <laughs> and he was really mad about it. Well, then uh, Henry Hager was doing mid-engine Corvettes. In fact, there were two or three going on. And uh, DeLorean was head of Chevrolet. And every time they would take the mid-engine Corvette out to show DeLorean, he'd say, get the Mangusta. And it was a very unfair comparison because, you know, the Mangusta headlights were four inches low and there were just all kinds of things that you couldn't... It was not a good comparison. It was a good vision for design, but... It, but it had so many advantages that it was a bad comparison. Is, is that because they didn't have to have the same regulatory issues that right, they just you guys what, were facing? They just it, did what they wanted. So you said that the windshield was sloped 68 degrees. 60, and 68 and degrees was the 60. fastest windshield in the industry. Mm -hmm. And we were all told, oh, you can't get, if you get past 65 degrees, you won't be able to see. Mm. And here, here it was, 69 degrees, and I'm driving behind it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were a lot of things like that on the Mangusta. So... Uh, they, Bill decided to sell it. There were complaints. Henry complained. So he said, okay, we'll send it to the warehouse. They sent it to the warehouse. It was over there. So when DeLorean asked for it, it was gone. It was mm -hmm. away, just across 12 Mile. Now, now, when you said that he drove it around the lake, this is the, the big pond at the tech center. Yeah. So, so that, that is the extent to which Bill Mitchell had driven this he thing. he drove it. And, and yeah. can you imagine that, you know, he, he spends all this money on buying this car and he just drives it, you know, what would that be? Like a mile and a half maybe? Oh, not even probably. Yeah, and that's crazy. Yeah. But, but now that car had some influence on the car that when you went to Germany and got involved. Oh, it in had influence on a lot of cars all over the world. Mm -hmm. When that car came out, if you imagine, uh, before the Mangusta, uh, cars were quite round. Uh, there were the heavy forms, think, uh, you know, think 65, 66, 67, emerging from the 50s, slowly step, step, step. And then all of a, cause, all of a sudden comes uh, these two cars, the Ghibli and the Mangusta. And because they're so low, 
uh, they're reflecting things that regular cars don't reflect. They look like mirrors. You're looking at the hood and it's, it's like a red mirror like on my car. And so uh, what happened was you could look at a, a lot of cars of that era and you'll see the influence. The 71 Camaro had the sharp brake line with very extreme tuck under. The taillights on the Camaro and the Firebirds, the Mongoose was in the garage. They were looking for how to finish off their quarters. Uh, but it, it influenced a lot of cars. And there were a lot of cars that followed it, Italian uh, special cars, that uh, imitated it. But no one ever did it as well as Gicciaro. He, he, he and Gicciaro did both those cars, the, yes. the Mangusta and... Yeah, at that Turin show, he did the Mangusta, he did the Ghibli, and two or three other cars that were in that Turin show. Yeah. What designer these days has multiple cars in a show? Anybody? Probably not anymore. No, right? not any. In, in, in the Mangusta, he had done a car called the Fidia, four-door sedan, for Bizzarini. And uh, he, at that time, had left Ghia. He was wanting to start his own company. He's freelancing, so he's thinking, what can I do? To, I have to make something happen. So he proposed a mid-engine uh, partner to the Fidia. The Fidia had the sharp, flat surfaces, the sharp lines, and so he proposed a companion to the Fidia as a two-passenger mid-engine sports car because he had worked on the on the uh, Mura before he left Bertoni. Mm. So he knew all that, how that worked, and uh, so he's at home and he makes a four-view drawing of the Mangusta and takes it into Ghia. Di Tommaso is in the buying process. I don't know exactly where they were, but uh, Di Tommaso was buying Ghia at that time. And so they somehow it went from a drawing to a full-size model. I think it was fiberglass model. And Di Tommaso buys the company. His brother-in-law's get him the money. He buys the company. And he has a failed chassis project that he had worked on with Carol Shelby called the P70. And it was a race car chassis they were going to sell to whoever wanted to race. It was designed around small block engine, small block Chevrolet, small block Ford. The only problem was just before they finished, Chevrolet came out with the big block. All the prototype <laughs> sports racing went out the window, and it was the Chevrolet big block that took over. So their chassis was dead. Okay, he has it. So he buys Gia. He's got the chassis. Here's the body from Gigero. Four months later, he puts it in the two pieces in the turn show, and he says, I'm putting these two cars together, and I'm going to put a car on the road, and it's going to be called the Mangusta. Hmm. So now talking of chassis, so, so when you went to Europe in 1971, just shortly after getting the Mangusta, you went with a yep. drawing of a, of a car, which I think is, is phenomenal, that... Uh, had been the Oldsmobile version yeah, of a Vega? Before I left, I was working in a great place called uh, Overseas Studio. And we were relating to the studios in Brazil, Australia, Germany, England. Um, and we were, but we were doing projects for the United States. And uh, we got a project to do an Oldsmobile. And I had been in Oldsmobile uh, several years earlier, worked on the Tornado and all those cars up until uh, the sixty and the sixty sevens, and uh, so we got a project, and the project was do a sport coupe, small sport coupe off of the Vega platform. So we did this little car. It was a beautiful little car. It was called Oldsmobile eight 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 triple eight, and um, uh, that car was done. Uh, when I left, I had some sketches. I took one sketch with me. And shortly before I left, the project was canceled. Oh, uh, here's the sketch. There's yeah. the sketch, yeah. Yeah, shortly before and the... sure don't look like no Vega to me. No, because it was, it was not supposed to look like a Vega. It was supposed to look different. In fact, I think probably one of the reasons it was canceled was it probably looked too good. <laughs> it looked really good. It, we had... Uh, our clay model was red. Uh, I did the side, and uh, uh, another designer came named uh, Dennis Wright, who had worked on the Chaparrales with Larry Shinoda. He did the front and the back, and um, uh, we had the headlights looking like uh, uh, Mercedes. They looked like you know they were flush with the body with a 
uh, a big round lamp inside of it. But anyway, um, we did that car, it was ready, it looked great. And then shortly before I left, it got canceled. So I took this sketch with me. And, and so you go, to, you go to Germany and there's a, a German race car driver, Eric Bitter, yeah. who had gone to Opel and said, I want you to develop a car for me based on the Diplomat platform. Right. Now, the whole collection there of, of influences, Bob Lutz was the um, uh, head of marketing for Germany, not for all of Europe, for Germany only. He was a young guy in his early 30s, and Eric Bitter was in his early 30s, Dave Holes. We were all about the same age. George Gallion was there, a great guy, great designer. And uh, so uh, six months after I got there, I was, I, or, uh, I was there five months. I'm getting ready. This is going to be my last, sh uh, you know, experience, one month. And so Dave said, I want to put you in, um, he had put me in an interior studio. And he said, you'll never get another chance to work on interior. So spend a little time in there and, you know, learn about all that. I said, great. Because for me, it was supposed to be a learning experience. So um, I was there. I did an interior. And I put little emblems on the tack and the speedometer like the Mangusta had, but they were opal emblems. And uh, door handles like the Mangusta and some other little details to make really give it kind of an Italian sporty look. This was the interior. I just remembered this the other day. I kept looking at the emblems on the bitter and thinking, where did that come from? There was something about it. Anyway, uh, he took me from there and put me in Herb Kilmer's uh, studio. Herb Kilmer was a wonderful German designer. He embodied everything classy and elegant about German design, and he was doing the big cars. So Herb was in there, and uh, another designer, uh, Hideo Kodama, was in there, first uh, Japanese designer hired by a European company. And then there were a couple, of, uh, a couple more guys. And uh, I was in there about a week, and Dave came in and said, we got a special, a special project. We're going to do a low coupe off the diplomat platform. Well, he knew about that earlier. He knew about that maybe two, three weeks before. But finally it happened. They got the approval. And uh, somehow Eric Bitter had probably Bob Lutz had some influence, uh, talked people into doing a special bodied car off the Opel Diplomat chassis, which was an excellent chassis. It had a lot of accolades from the German magazines. It was really good. And so here's this car now on this excellent chassis. And I'm sure the Opel, uh, whoever was in charge of Opel, um, can't remember his name now, but I'm sure the, the, uh, the direction was do a great looking car. We don't want a car, him out there bitter with a car that isn't really good looking. If he's going to have our platform, it's got to be good looking. So um, we get this assignment. We have one month to create a theme for this car. Not a lot of time. Not, not, no, not a lot of time at all. Uh, and, uh, you know, about uh, one-fifth the time you would normally spend if you were doing something fast. So I put my sketch up, and everybody went through their drawers and found two, three things and put them up. Hopefully, it might, there might be some clues there about what to do. And uh, the next morning, Dave came in and looked around. He said, Here, take this one, the red one, the, the red sketch you just saw. Of the Oldsmobile. Of the Oldsmobile. Of the eight, uh, yeah, he doesn't care. The 888, eight, yeah. Right. The Oldsmobile's gone. It, yeah. It's yeah. gone. Uh, so, and he said, start a scale model on this. Well, what he was doing, you know, I've been in the same situation. What he was doing is he wanted to get started. Okay, and there were, there were a few pieces there that looked good. It would be a good start. And so, um, you know, they were already making little foam bucks so we can start these little scale models with mirrors in the middle. So you had two sides, mm. and there were, were two of them, so four sides. So I got started really quickly with this thing, got going very quickly, and he, he picked uh, a couple more, so they got started. And uh, a couple of days later, he came back, and uh, it was coming along great. In the meantime, I didn't want it to look like the Oldsmobile. I mean, it didn't look European. The Oldsmobile didn't. Uh, so I was working on the body side. And uh, I'd created another sketch. That's the kind of maroon and green one. And 
that was going to be, yeah, the right, one the on the here. top there. Uh, I had created that sketch with this high tail and uh, uh, the DLO still, you know, the, you know, the glass line still climbing into the quarter and the thin roof. And I had that, and I was going to have this soft shoulder on the side where you see that dark red color. And to do that on a clay model, what you first do is you create a hard line. And so we created a hard line, sculpture. We put that in. We got the attitude right. And we're just getting ready to roll it off, and Dave came by and looked at it. And when you mean roll it off, you mean just sort of get rid of that hard line. Get rid of the hard part of it so you just have the shoulder. The highlight, the horizon line, would be in the same place as it was if it were hard. But instead of being hard, it's a softer shoulder. So Dave came in and looked at it, and he said, That's, that looks great. I said, well, we're going to roll this off now like my sketch. He said, no, 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 don't do that. Leave it just like that. Perfect. And uh, I said, well, I'll have to put some kind of wheel ups. He said, well, just make them like the Mangusta. So, okay, so I did that. So then at that point in time, we had the roof. We had the belt line. We had the quarter. We had the wheel ups. We had the heartbreak in the side. And uh, that was the car. So he then, we then, a couple of days later, we're working on it, and Eric Bitter came by. And Eric was, uh, every time he came, he brought little sketches. Now, Eric wasn't a designer. He was an engineer. Uh, but he was doing these little sketches to show Dave what he thought should happen. So you can imagine, this is a real... <laughs> he's the guy that owns the project, right? And Dave always... It was a great lesson. Dave always treated his, him and the sketches with greatest respect. He looked at everything. He talked about what he was being shown and whatever. Uh, you know, it... You can imagine who's going to walk in the door with sketches in a professional design organization that's been running for years with people who have been doing it for years and have something that is going to blow them away. You know, it's probably not going to happen. And so anyway, Dave uh, always looked at everything Eric had with great respect. And there was a lot of discussion. And he convinced uh, Eric that the car should look Italian. Because the highlights of design at that time still were the Ghibli and the Mangusta. So it should look Italian. And um, so Eric kind of went along with that. Well, then when he saw what we were doing, he got excited. And, so, and that was it. So then the, the next uh, two and a half, three weeks, we spent refining uh, our models. And then after about two weeks, um, mine was chosen and all the effort was put on mine. The rest of them went away. And I remember at the time there was, it's really interesting how long it takes uh, some technologies to emerge. One of the things that had to be done, the car, Dave wanted hard top glass. That was the big American thing. Hard top glass like convertibles, you know, no door frame. Well, if you're in a car that goes fast, that glass is wanting to tip out. You get wind noise. You get, you're going along, everything's fine. You reach a certain speed, and all of a sudden the glass pops. You get this huge noise sound of the, of the air leaving the compartment, past your compartment. And so this company had come up with this idea of have a little electric motor, and so you, you can have a channel for the glass like this, and when you shut the door, the glass goes up. Okay? Mm -hmm. So... We were trying to do that on this car, and, and the engineer, the studio engineer, you know, he was working on that with this company. Well, it didn't happen. It took another 20 years for that to happen. Right. Every, every, every car you see now, any kind of coupe, convertible. All uh, have it. Right. Yeah, they all have it, and it's because now technically or it's electronically it's capable of happening. Uh, but anyway, th that went away. But um, the other significant thing, I was drawing the hatchback on this scale model. It was clay, and I was drawing with a knife, and Dave came by. And uh, so I had these lines, and he said, what are, the, what, are the, what are those lines? I said, well, that's the, the frame. He said, well, you don't need a frame. I said, you mean just a piece of glass without a frame? He said, yeah, why not? I said, I don't know. So we left the frame off. Well... The previous concept car, this uh, one that Chuck Jordan did, the Astra CD, 
done about two and a half years earlier. Also, also in Germany. Yeah, also had a frame, a frameless hatchback, glass. They had a lot of shape in it, but didn't have a frame. So anyway, that, that turned out to be a very significant uh, part of the design. But so I'm supposed to go in um, first, uh, I think, November 29 or something like that. And so I told Dave, I said, you know, I'm going to be going tomorrow. He says, no, no, you can't go. Uh, I want you to stay, stay another week. Well, you know, everything is all set up. My family, the flights, uh, all my stuff is packed. So I stayed another week. He said, I want you to work on the front and the back. He said, you should do that because you'll be glad you did that. And what he was trying to do, Dave had a real sense of history. Uh, and I think he even said something about it. What he was trying to do is, is to get me to really identify with the car as a single effort as mine, even though there were other people involved. And uh, I left the scale model, of course, and I went home and forgot about it because I was working on other, other things. And, uh, and so what happened then, uh, they took the, the scale model and I think it was sent to Bauer. Bauer made a full size hard model of some kind. They sent that back to Opal Design. I've seen pictures of that. And Opal Design kept working on the details. The guys in the studio, uh, George Gallion, Herb Kilmer, Hideo, Dave, whatever. And they finalized it and then sent it back. And Bauer, I'm sure, was involved in that. They'd come down and see what they were doing, make sure they could do it. And then uh, that was the end of it. And it went and, uh, and was produced. So the bitter, and, and 395 of these cars were made. Originally, they were going to, I am pretty sure originally they were going to be 1,200. Mm -hmm. They showed the car at the Frankfurt Show. They got huge reviews, uh, rave reviews, and uh, he took 200 orders, which was unbelievable. And uh, then three months later, the, uh, the gas crisis hit, and he lost all his orders, and he was like, here, I have a car that's not fuel efficient. Who's going to buy it? And uh, so they reconfigured the engine a little bit, and did some things to try to increase the fuel economy. And um, he start, built them, sold them, sold them till uh, maybe 1980. The one I have is a 79. And... Uh, um, well, you gotta be very pleased that you actually own one yeah, of these. Yeah, I, about, I never thought of buying it. Do you know how many are in the United States? Yeah, five. So including yours or... Yeah. So, and that's it. That's it. And so are you gonna have it at Eyes on Design? Yeah. So anybody who wants to see this car that happens to live in the Detroit area or, you know, could drive up uh, if you're uh, or down, because we've got a lot of Canadians who listen to the show as well, uh, they'll be able to see it at the Eyes on, Des on Design show. Yeah, I think it's in European sports class. Mm -hmm. It's um, the people who I bought it from liked cars, but they didn't know anything about cars. I know that's hard to understand, but it was pretty clear with uh, what I found. They had all the work done on this car. It, it spent most of its life in California. Mm -hmm. Came from Europe after a couple of years to Florida for a couple of years and then to California. And it stayed there the rest of its life till I bought it uh, three years ago. But they, they had a lot of things done and they didn't know what good work was or bad work. They just accepted everything. So I spent all this time fixing everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, you would know but, exactly how it's got to be fixed. But the guy had very good sense of design. He picked the perfect wheels that were period wheels, a cross-lace wheel that uh, was a development of the Chaparral wheel, or Bill Mitchell told Larry Shinoda, just make it look like a wire wheel, and he, went, and he left the room. And that became the lightest, strongest, first uh, uh, wheel that was modular ever created. And Larry Shinoda did that. And so those wheels are on the car. Um, they put a new Chevy engine in it. They put a, a relatively recent uh, 350 horsepower engine. R the original car had 225. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had it painted a beautiful pearlescent amethyst purple, which most of the time it looks like a black car till you get the sun just right. And then it's this beautiful reddish purple blue. The interior is, is original except for the seats, front seats, blue, and uh, in unbelievable original shape because the guy was, I think he didn't have any kids or his kids were older and they never were in the car. Nobody was ever in the car. Hmm. Wow. 
That's great. It's great to know that it's in such good condition. And, and, and again, you know, anybody who's in the area can get a chance to look at it. But yeah, they're going to have, I think, 300 cars this year. I just read the, um, the assessment in the Gross Point News, and they're going to have a lot of cars. So is uh, St. John's. They're going to have almost 300 cars this year. Well, so there, there'll be a lot to see. With that, we're going to have to wrap this up. But Dick Rosen, thanks so much for sure. stopping by and sharing all this knowledge with us. I hope you can fit some of it into the program. <laughs> That's right. Real good. So, Gary, next week, you're on your own. I am. I'm going to be on vacation. Well, I won't be on my own. We're going to have a, we're going to have a journalist panel extraordinaire. Okay. Real good. But uh, you'll be in the driver's seat. Indeed. Completely on your own in that one. Okay. So good. Want to thank uh, you guys for being here. And, of course, want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires. Your journey, our passion. And by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.